so that in case anyone's missed it, they're able to go back and watch it at their leisure. And you may do the same. We'll send an email shortly after. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. If you would like to see only the speaker um, to help make your viewing experience a little more focused, just go up to the right corner and hit view and select speaker view. Um, Tonight, our guests are going to discuss some special traits that Alaska uniquely shares with the world. We're going to go on a virtual exhibition depicting an Alaskan perspective on climate change and witness messages from the front lines. As you know, Alaska is warming at a much faster rate than the rest of the United States. And while much of our work here at Alaska Wilderness League protects our ecological treasures in Alaska, like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and the Arctic Ocean, for Alaska's people and the rest of our country and its wildlife, protecting these places from oil drilling also helps us keep Arctic oil in the ground, which is going to be a huge component in winning the battle against climate change. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about our guests tonight that are going to share their special experiences with you. Uh, Lindsay Karen is an artist and educator living in both Los Angeles and Alaska, and she's the curator of the virtual exhibition Why We Won't Just Leave what Alaska is telling the world about climate change. In Los Angeles, she works with young children and an immersive nature-based uh, learning program called Everwild. She partners with the local community on murals and other projects to reduce environmental footprints. And in Alaska, Lindsay's worked the past five years as an artist in residence with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. She's also illustrated children's books, her travels have taken her to incredible lands where she's met inspiring people and learned about rich cultural traditions. So I can't wait to hear what she's gonna share with us tonight. Polly Andrews is Chupik from the villages of Chivak and Lower Kalskeg in Southwest Alaska. She's currently pursuing a master's in education with a focus on creating culturally responsive connections that enhance perspectives and build positive outcomes between native and non-native professionals and communities. She also enjoys sharing the Chupik culture and performing arts through song, dance, story, and spoken word. Today, Polly's a mom to three lively children and their favorite pastime includes returning to the village for fish camp and subsistence activities. And so with that, I would love to hear more from Lindsay um, and Polly. Take it away, guys. Thank you so much, Alaska Wilderness League, for hosting us. And thank you, Polly Andrews, for co-presenting with me. I am grateful for the lands and waters of Alaska that nourish me deeply and, like many of you, make me feel alive and bring me home to myself. I'm going to begin sharing tonight a video that I have compiled over some time visiting in Alaska um, from various places around Alaska from just clips from my phone. And it's a little bit of a dive into how I have seen Alaska over the years and I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. 
on my ankle. I, uh, I'm gonna wash it or we take a bath, Sunny and I said, Sunny, look. And, uh, my hair could cover my whole body. Whole body. Uh, By Gapti and Sarawik and all the way up to Shangnat and those little villages and go back on the other side.
Mm. So I'm tuning in today from Los Angeles, Yanga, the unceded and traditional lands of the Gabriel Tamba. The air is scented so beautifully right now with blossoms of orange and lemon trees and wisteria and jasmine. The canyons are coated with new green, mugwort and wood sorrel. Mated pairs of falcons are flying through the air and screeching. Gray and humpback whales are skirting the edges of our coast as they make their way up north. In Alaska, the rich soil is brimming with the potential of spring, albeit still under snow. The unfurling of leaves in spring is likened to the unfurling we feel in our bones after months of hibernation. And it's been a really long hibernation. That same unfurling brings a bear out of its den and prompts birds on their migrations. I'm going to share some of my artwork and a little bit more of my story. And I'm gonna share my screen again and we'll dive in. Give me one moment as I set this up right. <laughs> It is not letting me um, do full screen, but that's okay. We're going to work with what we've got. All right. I invite you to take a moment with this artwork and then answer three questions. What do you see? What do you feel? What are you reminded of? And we're gonna do this together and you can share your responses in the chat box. All right, are you ready? So what do you see? What do you feel? And what are you reminded of?
Our observations, our feelings and responses, and our memories are the essence of a place. Essence is part of the word essential, the building blocks foundation, the energy of a place. The people of a place embody its essence. They carry it in their knowledge, stories, and experiences. They bring it to life in flesh and bone through words and song, art and actions. People enable the essence of a place to travel with them and share it with the world. Along my Alaskan travels, the Alaska Native women I have met have graced my path with essence of place. Women like Polly Andrews, who you will meet shortly, Bernadette Dementif, Sophie Sakar, and Julie Mailer. They hold fortitude rooted deep in the earth and a humble belief in themselves nurtured by the strength of community. I have noticed that this vibrancy also reflects their ability to take pause and receive. We are privy to the wisdom within the cycles if we pause long enough to listen and feel. The elders that I have met in my travels north have shared and emphasized the importance of cycles. There is connection between all pieces within an ecosystem and all follow these cycles. We cannot separate them out and look at one in its full integrity without taking into account the whole system. This is what is failing about our Western science, economic and political systems, warned Unungan elder Alarian Mikuliev in my recent interview with him. We must address the whole. This sheds light on the importance of taking an interdisciplinary approach in dealing with the most pressing issues of our time, such as climate change, economic and social injustice and racism. They are all connected and all seen clearly through the lens of the injustices and hurt caused to our planet. When we are disconnected from our hearts, it is far easier to cause pain to ourselves, to others and to our environments. We are a species with a seemingly inexhaustible laundry list of global issues, each more complex and nuanced than the previous. To this, Alarian said, we need a change of consciousness. Plotting adventurous mountain runs and kayak trips with kooky and talented Alaskan friends, harvesting wild mushrooms and berries, watching the bush plain disappear on the horizon while surrounded by 19 million acres of wilderness, having a couple perilously close calls in Alaska's sometimes harsh elements, learning how to pull fish from a net with a patient Yupik elder, have all made space for learning and growing within me. These experiences taught me that each choice I make has an outcome and a consequence that connects me with my surroundings. Wilderness is humbling. It liberates me from the ego mind, the ever revolving melodrama of individuation, comparison and achievement. I am placed a tiny speck in the middle of an intricate web of interconnection. Wilderness shows me my place. If I make decisions that are in balance with my surroundings, I find I belong. The search for belonging is a pervasive one, especially in today's society where so many individuals are removed from their ancestral legacies, either by choice or force. This search is evident in my home in Los Angeles where people like me arrive uprooted from around the world to start anew in the city of angels. We seek to belong to society, a human created maze that can gobble up even the most discerning. Belonging makes us feel good and contributing grants us purpose. But in a society that has stripped those most connected to a sense of belonging, indigenous people, of their rights, land, ability to thrive and their very dignity, we are all left disconnected. Societies created by nature are likely a great place to turn for solutions to the challenges within our human created ones, and they are a source of healing. I have learned from my experiences and friends in Alaska that our hearts burst wide open when we ignite our innate connection to the environments that hold us, tend to them, and all of the beings who make them home, lend our skills and gifts to our communities and give and receive from the abundance around us wholeheartedly. It is a recipe for healing and happiness, a recipe for restoration, and when the time is right, a recipe for growth. We cannot solve the climate crisis alone, but as a web of interconnected communities tending to resilience right at home and sharing resources and knowledge amongst each other, 
we may have a shot. So why would an artist from Los Angeles care so much about sharing stories from Alaska? Because I know that the change that is occurring in Alaska due to climate is not only devastating to local ecosystems, animals, and people, but it's also impacting the world. I know the choices that I make in Los Angeles affect the choices that people have in Alaska's towns. The more we can see how ecosystems around the globe are interwoven, the more compassion and care we will have for tending to those right at home. Every time I have the opportunity to share what I have learned from Alaska with people here in Los Angeles, my heart shines. I know Alaska has a message for the world and it is time to listen. I am so honored to introduce Polly Andrews. She's a beloved friend of Chupik heritage from Lower Kalskag on the Kuskokwim River. She is the daughter of my very first refuge guide, Roger Kay, and an absolute inspiration. Polly uplifts her Chupik cultural traditions with song, dance, and traditional storytelling. My life is enriched by knowing her. Polly, over to you. Kuyana Chaknak, thank you, Lindsay, for sharing your story, your beautiful images, and for starting us off in a good way. Generations and generations ago in my region, there was a mother and father who had a son, an only son. And this son had no brothers and sisters, so the parents thought among themselves, who is going to be there to teach our son how to be a nukashbak, a successful hunter? So they searched throughout the region, my region, for a, a shaman, a knowledgeable medicine man who would be there to help teach their son how to become a nukashbak, a successful hunter. So, so this shaman told the parents, I will take your son for a season but you mustn't worry about him because he will feel your worry. Don't worry. So the shaman took the boy to the edge of the water, the edge of the Bering Sea coast. And when the boy became aware, he looked around him and he was in a men's house, Qazrik, surrounded by a group of men. Some men had blonde hair, some men had, men had blonde hair with black spots, and some men had fur with rings on them. And when the little boy became more aware, he took a second look and he realized he wasn't surrounded by men. He was surrounded by seals. And one seal swam to the boy and said, I'm going to be your mentor for this season. I will teach you how we live and how we see. And there would be days when the boy would hear a mysterious tapping and scraping noise from up top in the ice at the surface of the ocean. And the boy would ask his seal mentor, what is that noise? And the seal would, would say, I'll show you. And they would swim up. You hear that tapping and scraping noise? That is a man from your village and he's shoveling his path. He keeps his pathway clear of snow so that in seal hunting season, we can see him and we will give ourselves to that hunter. There were other days when the ice melted on the surface of the ocean that the seal mentor would take the boy to the surface of the ocean and they'd watch in the distance and one day the boy pointed and he said, look, I see a man in his kayak. And sure enough, he looked and a man was kayaking across the ocean. But there was something unusual this boy noticed about the man and his kayak. It was not touching the surface of the water. It was only hovering above the ocean. And the boy asked the seal, how come I only see that kayak hovering above the water, it's not touching the water. And the seal mentor told the boy, his kayak is not touching the water because he never stopped to think about the ocean. And that's how we see that hunter. 
we will know in hunting season. And there were other days when the seal mentor would take the boy to the surface of the water and they would look and they would see another hunter in his kayak. And they would watch as the hunter would mindfully scoop up his berries from his agudak bowl and splash it into the ocean water. And the boy said, how come that hunter puts berries into the water? And the seal said, that's a gift for us. That hunter is very mindful of us. And so come spring season, we know to give ourselves to that hunter. There were other days when the seal mentor would bring the boy to the surface of the water and they would look in the distance and they would watch the men and the women in the village. And there was one woman in particular, she would crawl out of her azrik, her sod house. And the boy noticed that she was covered in dirt and darkness. And the boy would say to the seal mentor, how come I see that woman with dirt and darkness on her face? And the seal told the boy, we see her like that because come spring hunting season, she doesn't take good care of our bones. We know not to go to her. And there were other days when a different woman in the village would come out of her sod house, her kayirik, and her face would be illuminating in brightness. And her, the rough of her atkuk, her parka, would be shining in light and beauty. And the boy would say to the seal mentor, wow, she is shining so beautifully. And the seal mentor told the boy, we see her like that because she takes care of our bones. She takes good care of us in hunting season. We will remember that when spring hunting season comes. Eventually, after a whole season had passed, the boy eventually emerged from the water and he returned back to his parents. And from that day, that boy ended up growing up to become the strongest, most successful Nugashbak hunter in the region because he saw as the seals saw, he lived in the kingdom with them. Huaka huinga pali Andrews chuchtun atcha na pikyuk chufaka miungunga apama atcha ulgan Billy Andrews auchu mauglu matlu Cecilia Andrews awuk koyana tangshamchi my name is Polly and my Chupik name is Napiriuk. It means to sharpen and I was named after my great grandfather. My grandparents are the late Ulran Andrews and the living Cecilia Andrews and I come from the region of Kisunak, which today is known as the village of Chivak in Southwest Alaska. The way that I introduced myself was the Chupik way that my grandmother always taught me to introduce myself. She said, when you meet someone, you say three things about who you are, and that person will know you. She said, introduce yourself by your Chupik name, because that's who you were named after. Introduce yourself by who your grandparents are, and introduce yourself by the land where you come from. If you say those three things, that person will know exactly who you are. And first, I would like to begin by acknowledging the people and the land where I come from. Can everyone see this? Oops. How is that? Is that visible? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I come from the rich traditional knowledge and the coastal stories of my grandparents who are pictured here. Um, the coastal stories of my grandparents whose subsistence ways are guided by the seasons, whose survival is determined by the connectedness to the land and whose subsistence ways are alive today. And with a foot in two worlds, um, I, I was really blessed to be uh, raised by several different families. Up on the right-hand corner are a couple of my aunties from the Cuscoquim River in whom I'll make reference to in part of my story. 
And also there's that foot in two worlds because my life experiences also emerge from my gung-ho environmentalist Anwar protecting dad, Roger Kay, who you can see there uh, pictured there on the right-hand corner. Some of you may know him. I met my dad at the age of seven when he flew his Bush airplane into my dusty little village and he brought my sister and I to a place that was much different from where we were raised. He showed me a different kind of connectedness, one where you felt the challenge of crossing a waist deep river, glacial river in the wilderness, and one where you experienced the reward of what it meant to reach the top of a mountain in the Brooks Range with a 40 pound pack to experience the view, your personal view. And so going back to my early childhood, much of it was spent on the remote banks of the Cuscoquim River with my grandparents and my aunties and my uncles. We would spend weeks in the springtime snow at our family's um, spring camp harvesting ducks and geese and swans and beaver and muskrats. Yes, I said swans. <laughs> they're beautiful, but they're also very tasty as well and have helped sustain our people for many thousands of years. And we would spend also several months drift netting and smoking fish um, at our, at, in the summer at our family's remote fish camp. And there was something that my auntie would always do as soon as we'd put the boat into the water getting ready for a long family trip on the river, she would bend over the edge of the boat and she would dip her two hands into the river water and she'd splash the water on her face. And I would say, Auntie, how come before a long trip, you always take the river water and you splash it on your face? And she would answer me with these words. So the river will know us. And that same auntie of mine, um, she taught me that when we pick berries in the land, she taught me that when we sit down to eat, we always have to place our hands, um, we always have to take a piece of our lunch, our dry fish, and which was our food for the day and bury a little bit underneath the earth. And I asked her, why do we do that? Why do we take some of our food and put it under the earth? And she would just shrug and say, so we can be thankful. I also felt that it was so that the tundra would know us. And according to that ancient story, the boy who lived with the seals, was this also our way of stopping to think about the ocean so that our kayak would touch the water. And these little acts of thoughtfulness are so much more than the word tradition. They're so much more than an ancient story. Small acts that are done with deep intention, reflection, shows me that the land is beautifully and intricately somehow woven into me. And so, um, in closing, I wanted to share a song with everyone. Just a moment, let me go back to this one. I wanted to show you the words so that you would see the meaning of, of this song. This was a song that is composed by Asi Gayrayok, who comes from a village, a coastal village that's close to my village. And it tells that story of the boy who lived with the seals. And as you listen, my hope is that you can think on this. How can I walk on the tundra in a way that is gentle, intentional, mindful, thoughtful? How do I walk softly in a way so that the river will know us?
Oh my gosh, that was gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you, Polly. <laughs> wow. Hard to continue. Um, all right. So, um, Lindsay and Polly, this has been fantastic hearing your story so far. Um, I hate to shift away from them for a moment, but we do have a really great um, additional piece from our annual giving manager, Ariel Baker, who's gonna talk a little bit about how Alaska Wilderness League is working to help keep all of these beautiful places wild. And then we're gonna give everyone a chance to ask questions of Polly and Lindsay. So Ariel, if you'd like to speak. Yeah, thanks, Hillary. I will go ahead and share my screen now. All right, great. Okay, um, yeah, well, first of all, just thank you so much, Lindsay and Polly, um, and for your incredible stories and just everything that you shared. Um, so like Hillary said, I am Ariel Baker. I'm our annual giving manager and a member on our development team. So I'm just going to take a moment to explain um, just how to get involved. Obviously, Lindsay and Polly shared some very compelling images and reasons and stories as to why protecting the Arctic Refuge is so important. So I just wanted to take a minute to explain how you can get involved with Alaska Wilderness League in order to support our efforts to conserve this very special place. Um, and the first is to take action. So keeping Arctic oil in the ground is crucial if we're going to successfully fight climate change. And one of the most important places to do that is in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. So bipartisan legislation has been introduced that will repeal the Trump era leasing mandate for the Arctic Refuge. So we're calling on you today to contact your representative to urge your Congress members to co-sponsor the act. And so you can do that using the link right there on the slide. And Lois is also going to put it in the chat. The second way to get involved is to make a donation. So Alaska Wilderness League's work is made possible only because of donations from supporters like you. And now is a very crucial time to creating lasting protections for the Arctic Refuge. So we hope that you will give as generously as you can today. And you can use the link right there on the slide and Lois is also going to put it in the chat. 
And finally, one more way to engage with us is to follow us on social media. Um, so I've included our social media handles, both for Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter um, right there on the slide. And I've also included Lindsay's Instagram, which I think Lois also put in the chat. I know that I actually just followed Lindsay and am already really excited just at looking at her feed to have her beautiful artwork and all of the efforts that she has to fight, fight for climate change right in my Instagram feed. Um, so I hope that you'll join me in following Lindsay and also following Alaska Wilderness League. Um, and with Alaska Wilderness League, you'll get updates on actions that we're promoting as well as matching gift opportunities and just beautiful pictures of the places that we all care so much about. So with that, I just want to thank again um, Lindsay and Polly for their incredible um, time today and sharing their story with us. Um, so now I'm going to give it over to um, Hillary for questions. Great. Thank you, Ariel. Um, so we have a few questions. Um, and one of them was um, early in your video, Lindsay, there were a couple of shots of bears and um, two questions about the bears. One of them was, um, where were the bears? And the second was, how, how did you get so close to them? And what, um, what can you tell us about the experience of watching the bears? I was incredibly fortunate to travel to Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge in 2019. And we stayed um, alongside a fish weir. Um, and it was an incredible experience, a very special place. Um, as many of you probably already know, a fish weir collects um, fish and holds them for a period of time while they can be counted um, before they enter and continue on their journey, which kind of you know stops up the flow a little bit and uh, makes it a perfect opportunity for predators to come down and feed. And um, the bears loved that place. And um, Lisa Hupp and I, she was my guide and wonderful companion on this trip. And um, it was just she and I and um, two of the staff who were counting fish. And we would sit on a little knoll um, overlooking um, the zone where the salmon were congregating um, before they were being ushered through the weir. And um, just a magical, magical place. Um, the bears knew we were there and expected to see humans just on that little knoll. And we were, you know, within 15, 20 feet from them. And at times there would be um, multiple families coming down to feed um, three sows with nine cubs and um, just a, a feeding fest. And it was so peaceful. And it was one of my most favorite experiences with the bears because we all felt at ease and um and the bears felt so comfortable that the moms would roll on to their backs and the cubs would come up and drink their milk and i had never seen that before and it just made my heart shine it was just so so stunning to to be amongst them in that kind of comfort that sounds amazing Wow. Okay. Um, so another question is about your artist in residence experiences and just trying to get a little more information about how that worked for you. If you were in multiple refuges and how you would move from one to the other, as well as how did you connect, find the different people that you featured in your artwork? So this was a brainchild of Polly's father, Roger Kay, um, who was my um, first guide and he chose my artwork to be part of the artist residency program with Arctic National Wildlife Refuge um, in 2016. And 
that's where the journeys began. And that summer we um, traveled to the southern portion of the refuge and spent half of our time in Arctic Village. Um, it was during the biannual Gwich'in gathering. Um, so we were very fortunate to be there during that time. And um, Roger had noticed that um, a lot of times artists come to these beautiful places and depict the, the epicness of the land and the wilderness and they forget the people. And the people are so much a part of the land. Um, and so he saw it as an opportunity um, to, to bring in that essence and that, that knowledge that is carried on that land and to honor the people who have been there for so long um, in reciprocity and in um, such a, a healthy relationship with this land um, so that we can all continue to enjoy it and say thank you for that, say thank you and we see you and you're still there and thank you. Um, and to lift those voices up, especially the elders. Um, and so the elder um, who was featured in that first piece, Trimble Gilbert, um, he was selected um, by the people and um, also by refuge staff who, who wanted to honor and acknowledge his contributions. Um, and so often it was a collaboration in that way. Um, as I traveled to the the other wildlife refuges that I've been to, um, it would be a collaboration between the people of the villages that I was traveling to and, and also refuge staff on who might be featured. And sometimes it was in incredibly organic too. Um, not everyone is um, desiring to be portrayed in that way. Um, and others were more open to it. And so it was always a dialogue, always that um, relationship building um, first and foremost. And then if something really started to click and um, jive and like the video showed a relationship that blossomed between me and Julie Mailer um, in Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge. And so at that point, it's like, oh yes, um, and then have that kind of conversation. Could I feature you in this, this artwork? Um, and so that was kind of how it would happen. Okay. Um, another question is for Polly. Can you, um, in the beginning, Hillary talked about the, your work on, in the, your master's work. And can you talk a little bit about the, your focus on the culturally responsive connections between native and non-native uh, professionals and communities and sort of what brought you to that space? Yeah, um, thank you for, for that. Um, let's see, uh, what I, I work in Alaska Native healthcare, specifically in en ending intergenerational um, cycles of, of trauma. Um, through through a lens of um, our Alaska Native culture and our strengths, and I I know that knowing my culture has given me strength, um, resilience, identity, and purpose. And I've seen that same um, thing reach many people, youth um, across Alaska, and. Also, I have given a, a presentation called Dangshemni, the way that we see, and it's about, um, it's an Alaska Native cultural workshop um, to, you know, help people understand our culture through the eyes of story, song, and dance, and oratory. And I had given that presentation about a year ago, and there was a woman the executive director of a shelter, a women's shelter here. And she came up to me after my presentation and she thanked me and she said, you know, so many of the women that we see come through the doors of our shelter are Alaska Native and we see them for the, the problems and the issues that they, they come in with, you know, from those broken places. And she said, what we fail to see is the beauty behind who they are. And you have reminded me of that today. And something happened, a light went off in my mind and I thought, well, I have, I have got to tell people and show people, help show people the, be the beauty behind who 
we are as Alaska Native people, because if they see us and understand us, that's where that relationship piece is. Lindsay talked about um, the importance of first and foremost building trusting relationships with our people. That's always number one. And so if I can be a part of that bridge, bridging that important gap that we have um, among our Native communities and so many of the programs and organizations that serve our communities or serve Alaska or in, you know, um, what a way to help link our people and build that trust and relationship that is so important for positive outcomes, no matter where you're coming from, from the approach of looking at the environment or the approach of flying into a village um, to work healthcare with our people. It is so, so important to have that um, relationship established and that trust and, and to really recognize the beauty behind um, truly who we are. Thank you. That leaves me with so many follow-up questions, but I'm going to try to um, follow a little bit about uh, what our members here have been asking. <laughs> um, yeah, that's so important. Um, so let's see, um, Lindsay, there's also a question about your artwork. Do you, is it available on your website for sale? Or if you if people want to go back and look at the different images, is there how would people be able to do that? Yeah, thank you. Um, you are absolutely welcome to journey on over to my website. And um, there's a whole lot more on there too. Um, and go ahead and look through and send me a message. Um, I'm best if you communicate to me directly. Um, so give me a phone call or um, email me about anything you might be interested in. And um, I also have a page on the webpage where you can purchase prints. Um, and there is more available than what is listed currently. So, okay, hey. thank you. Um, and let's see, I'm seeing two more questions. Um, if how do people find out about the artists in residence program? How does how does one begin that journey? Great question, um, and I would highly recommend it for anyone who is um, creative. I mean, um, my journey started with Voices of the Wilderness, which is, um, I believe, a forest service initiated program that pairs artists with stewards of different um, lands in Alaska. And so I was paired with US Fish and Wildlife Service as a steward to um, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And that got me started. And then I built a relationship with US Fish and Wildlife Service to um, continue journeying back to these places. Um, and so that would be a great starting point. Um, look up Voices of the Wilderness. Thank you. Um, Polly, I wonder if I can put you a little bit on the spot as we're getting close to five o'clock and just hearing you talk about the sort of hope that seeing places where you could build connections with your culture and um, in an attempt to help people, if you had something that highlighted kind of the hopefulness of that journey that we could kind of leave people with and how how making some of this progress is bringing people hope and making people's lives better and yeah i would love to just hear how you interpret that question and hear more about okay um what is the the main part of the question just how your your work in these communities through storytelling and song is bringing people hope and positivity in in Alaska and outside of Alaska. Mm, okay. Um, well, well, you know, there there is. I love sharing Chupik and Yupik story and song and dance. It's been a part of my healing journey, um, and I have such great pride for our Native community because. In the past five or so years, we've seen an explosion of um, Native artists 
who are utilizing their voice, their song, their dance, their art to impact people and communities in positive ways, whether that's addressing missing and murdered indigenous women, addressing domestic violence and child abuse, um, and, and also being a voice for the environment I am watching our Native people rise up in a warrior-like way and say, um, I live here and with, with the strength of my culture, I am a part of that solution. But one thing, when I've um, shared these presentations of Alaska Native Story Song and Dance, there is something about it that is inherent in all of us. These aren't just cultural values that are only Yupik, only Chupik. These are human values. We all, all of us on this Zoom today, we come from a people who used to sit around a fire and share a story together. We come from a people who we used to come together in ways that, that heal. We are a story people. We are a people of oratory. We are all emerge from a place where community is our strength and that collective nature of our people is our strength and all of those values, those are human. And so I think it's very, very important for all of us to remember that piece of, of who we are that we were all once this way. Thank you. Thank you so much. I completely agree. Um, and I think with that, um, I just want to thank both of you again for this wonderful journey. It's been so fun to hear your stories and your songs. Um, I am going out into the evening feeling very touched. So thanks all to all of our supporters out there um, who joined us tonight. And we will send out a video recording um, in an email tomorrow. So thank you again, everyone. Have a great night. Bye. <laughs>